In addition to being a privacy evangelist, my mindset is always about being aware of my environment. And that gives me a prepper mentality as well. A prepper attuned to tech. And this is a question that the average person definitely does not know much about. You've all heard of EMPs and how this will wipe out all of your electronic devices. But the reality is that if you actually understand how EMPs work, you will discover that it will not destroy every single device. Additionally, there are other threats that are very similar to EMPs like coronal mass ejection, and it is actually more likely that this will strike damage somewhere in the world. And man-made portable devices could be made that produce an EMP pulse, but not be tied to a nuclear explosion, though these have a shorter range. So this kind of threat is not as theoretical as you might imagine. The effect of wiping out electronics in most people's minds is the same as turning back civilization to the 1800s. Now, world events make us think of this more than usual, especially with a war involving a nuclear-equipped nation like Russia. But with a little bit of knowledge, we can actually be a little prepared so we can still have some electronics function in spite of an EMP or EMP-like event. Maybe we don't all have to have an 1800s experience. This is a highly interesting topic that you will enjoy, so please stay right there. Just a little bit of a background on me that fits this topic. Not only am I a tech guy, but I also have a deep interest in radio. In fact, I hold a general ham license. And of course, many of my tech topics involve radio since that is how most of our portable devices work today. Fortunately, this helps me understand a little bit more about the technologies involved. And I will explain it, hopefully, in layman's terms. An EMP or electromagnetic pulse is, as the name suggests, a very strong projection of electromagnetic energy in a very brief period of time. That's why it's called a pulse. You can actually think of an EMP as radio frequency interference, or RFI, except it is very strong. Parts of it occur in nanoseconds, and other parts of it can occur 30 seconds later. If a nuclear explosion occurs in the upper atmosphere, like 25 miles above ground, the atmosphere at that level actually protects us from any ionizing radiation emitted by the explosion. And this same atmosphere protects us from that dangerous radiation that comes from the sun. What happens, though, is that this explosion separates the electrons from the atoms in the atmosphere and causes an electric charge to occur. And while dangerous radiation or ionizing radiation cannot cross this level of atmosphere, the non-ionizing radiation or lower frequency radiation does in fact cross the lower atmosphere and causes strong magnetic effects on the ground. It does not affect your body, but it can affect electronics. Let me do this quick demonstration to show you what happens. This is a coil of copper. I've attached it to a multimeter so you can see what the voltage is. You can see that to start with, there is no voltage. But if I run a magnetic field through these coils using these magnets, you will see that it generates electricity. This phenomenon is called induction. Magnetic fields moving over wires moves electrons and thus creates electricity. This is a very simplistic explanation of this phenomenon in physics. The longer the wires and the stronger and faster moving the magnetic fields, the stronger the flow of electricity. It is estimated that during an EMP, the voltages in the electric grid wires that send electricity to every home would be around 50,000 volts in some incredible amount of amps, which is quite a bit more than the 110 volt and typical 15 amps we use in typical US home circuits. The effect of this is, of course, to burn circuits of anything connected to the electrical grid. This will burn transformers at the grid end, and any device plugged in will also get this huge pulse of electricity. 
I would imagine that this would also cause fires in homes. The part that most people don't realize is that at a voltage of 50,000 volts and thousands of amps, even if the breakers in your home trigger, this high voltage would cause current sparks and it will cross even gaps in wiring on the breakers. The vices that are switched off but are attached to house wiring will also receive the pulse via sparks that cross the gaps in switches. Now, there's actually another element in EMPs that is quite interesting. Scientists have tracked that EMPs actually cause three separate events. The first pulse is called E1, which occurs in the first few nanoseconds, and are high frequency pulses. This stops off at around 100 gigahertz, so something higher frequency than 5G phone signals, but lower than microwave. Then an E2 burst follows shortly, which is a wideband radio frequency event similar to lightning, but it is not as damaging, so I won't focus on this. The most significant event is actually the E3 event. During an explosion, the Earth's magnetic field is actually shifted out of position, but then this slowly shifts back at around 30 seconds after the explosion and lasts for 30 seconds. This Earth magnetic field movement is low frequency and has a very long wavelength and causes particular damage to long wires like electrical transmission lines. Moving such an amount of a magnetic field will create a lot of electromagnetic energy. This is the one that causes the most damage to the electric grid. What you can tell from what I said here is that there are different frequencies involved and radio frequencies are typically described by their wavelength. Antennas react to frequencies in the same wavelength and ignore frequencies not in that wavelength. This is referred to as resonance. In an E3 event, the very long wavelengths will match the long wires in the electric transmission wires, and those wires are resonant to these long frequencies and will capture that energy. In contrast, your phones are designed with antennas resonant in the sub 1 gigahertz to 3 gigahertz range. This means that it ignores the frequencies in the 100 gigahertz range or the low frequencies like 1 megahertz. So induction will not have any significant effect on a device that doesn't have a wire at the length of the wavelength of the EMP frequency. It will still capture some of that electromagnetic energy, but very weakly, like a weak radio signal. Think of any existing wire as an antenna, and this is what captures the electromagnetic energy. But as I said, it will only capture a significant portion of that energy only if the antenna is resonant to that frequency. There are two types of effects to consider with small home devices. First, small devices that are near outlets or circuits that can cause a spark will of course suffer from the effects of E3. Sparks will cause that 500 volts to cross through to the device. Nowadays, extremely small transistors and computers have very small nanometer gaps in the circuitry, which could easily spark even at lower voltages. And this is why plugged-in devices normally wouldn't be expected to survive an EMP E3. The other indirect effect is if the E1 level pulse, which goes up to 100 gigahertz, reaches the phone. Now, this is a wideband signal, and some of it can match the frequency of the antennas in 5G phones, for example. But only some of it will reach the phone, since most of the frequencies will not be resonant to the phone's wires. Additionally, phones have a lot of EMF shielding to extraneous frequencies, so unless it's near some other circuitry attached to the grid, it could actually survive the EMP. Now, just to be clear, there's hardly a chance that your near cell tower would survive an EMP because, of course, that equipment is plugged into the grid. So there won't be a cell infrastructure in place at all. That will be wiped out. It should be obvious, too, that the entire internet in that area will be wiped out. But your phones may operate as phones without SIM cards. Very interesting, right? 
So if you have some book reader like Kindle and have downloaded survival books, you might actually have something to read. Now let's progress further here. Let me extend the scenario a little bit more so I can generalize what can happen. Any device that is not plugged into the grid, like most portable devices running on battery, as long as they do not have long wires that match the frequency of the EMP or have no antennas, will not generate that induction effect that causes excessive high voltage. For example, if you have Raspberry Pis unused and unplugged, even unused laptops or old phones, they might survive. Batteries unplugged may survive. Now, how do you power these? How about solar panels? Interestingly, solar panels themselves don't have long wires. Though they may have long wires if connected to charge controllers, inverters, and batteries. Again, think about this. Solar panels unplugged may survive. Here's a little proper tidbit. If you have backup devices that you don't use, like spares, you can wrap them completely in aluminum foil, then store them far away from any house wiring. Better yet, you could put these devices in a metal container like a sheet metal office cabinet or a gun safe. Additionally, keeping them in aluminum foil keeps out RF frequencies that can cause induction and enter into small holes. I'd also wrap them in non-conductive addition. Of course, with something kept in a metal safe, the only fear is that RF can enter through small holes in the cabinetry. And these will be limited to wavelengths that are smaller than the size of the hole. Small holes will be close to the 100 gigahertz range, which incidentally is not that damaging to phones. For example, the wavelength of 2 millimeters equates to about 148 gigahertz. Thus, if roughly 100 gigahertz is the maximum frequency we expect, then we should be okay with holes less than 2 millimeters. Now, if I'm thinking of basic prepper things to plan for, I would definitely prepare old phones, maybe those with a full load of books on Kindle, MP3 files, and other digital resources. Spare electronics like Raspberry Pis, especially older versions, could be useful. Things you're not using anymore. Solar panels, particularly the smaller ones that are easy to store and can power up small electronics, would be important to do this aluminum foil storage. And radios. You can get UHF, VHF ham radios like Baofeng UV5R models for as cheap as $20. These have tremendous range. Normally these require a ham license, but obviously after an EMP, there will be no government. I'll put links to the devices I mentioned in the description. If you store these radios without the antennas, they will still have an even better chance of surviving. I have a portable HF radio, for example, that is easily stored and could communicate with radios on the other side of the earth, but unfortunately packing it means I can't use it. However, normally it is not stored with antennas, so it could survive. Now I haven't done this yet, but I should plan on putting it in a Faraday bag for storage and not keep it near the antennas, which could get induction. If you have any car likely newer than 1970s, then it's going to have electronics. There's a lot of wiring in cars that's going to get hit by that E3 wave. They've actually tested some cars and some survived because the wiring was next to the metal body. But some cars have the wiring running underneath the body and the EMP waves actually bounce off the ground. But I would not expect it to survive. Obviously, EV cars have even more wiring and, and electronics, so that will definitely not survive. Besides, there will be no grid to charge them. Now, I happen to have a boat with a diesel engine. Mine comes with an electronics module, which has broken before. What is interesting is that assuming the battery wiring survives, and it likely will because it is very short, I can bypass the electronic module and start it. I've actually done this bypass already. However, since there's a lot of wiring in the alternator, I would assume the alternator would suffer induction effects and burn up. So it would be an engine without an alternator. You'd have to charge a battery using solar. Now, there's almost zero chance of anything surviving in your house wiring system, even if you turned off 
all the breakers. As I said, 50,000 volts would spark over a breaker pretty easily and even larger distances. So your house will be back to the 1800s. But hold on, it's not all problematic. Assuming you haven't put large solar panels in storage wrapped in aluminum foil, there is a huge chance that generators would survive, especially one not in use during the EMP event. Storing a generator with some sort of cover like a copper fabric would ensure that the coils do not get induction, and that's extra insurance. Just to be careful though, since I mentioned earlier, the highest frequency that can be received has a wavelength of only two millimeters. So even a two millimeter hole will allow that frequency to enter. So just be aware of the protection needed for larger equipment and the fact that loose protection may not be enough. Though it may survive if it doesn't have anything that could operate as an antenna at those gigahertz frequencies, which is usually inches. Is there a chance of a plugged-in device like a ham radio surviving an EMP? Now, there are different approaches here for active protection of devices in use. There's actually a specialty type of surge protector that prevents sparks. I think they likely enclose the connectors in some sort of inert gas. Then when the electronics detect the spike and it breaks the connection before the damage is done. This could really be useful for protecting certain devices that are important to survival. Your lifestyle in case of an emergency event like an EMP can be enhanced with really just a few changes. If you have older phones and electronics that are functional, maybe wrap it in aluminum foil and store it. Get some inexpensive small solar panels and store it. Get a couple of cheap radios and store it. You could do this kind of prepping for $100. Now this video is not about survival during an event with rampant lawlessness, so you have to think beyond what I've said here. For example, I have a sailboat that can travel large distances and has a solar and water maker and can be self-reliant as long as there's a food supply. Now you might think this idea of protecting against an EMP is far-fetched and not likely something to worry about. Let me talk to you about a CME or coronal mass ejection. Apparently there's a 12% chance of this happening every 10 years. We haven't had this happen since 1859 in a populated area. But in 1859, the CME caused telegraph lines to spark up and cause fires. Again, long wires equals high voltage. I think this happened in Quebec, Canada. When this happens, it will tend to be more localized and also it will be equivalent to the E3 event, long wires and low frequencies. So likely affecting the grid and plugged in devices and less effect on portable devices. Unfortunately, most of the world is unprepared for this kind of impact on the electrical grid. If transformers blow up from high voltage, it may take years to get replacements. So for several years, a location hit by an EMP or some other electromagnetic disturbance will be in the Middle Ages for an extended period of time. Folks, I have a privacy-oriented platform called BraxMe, and we have over 100,000 users there exchanging information about how to maintain their privacy. Please join us in that community. On my platform, we also have a store that has various technologies that support our goal of maintaining privacy. These products include the SIM-free Brax Virtual Phone, the Google Phones, Identity-Free Brax Mail, and our Bytes VPN service. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.